I'm glad you're here. I've been waiting for you. I'm so excited. Hey, what do you think of the music? Huh? This is this is my brother Wes. Yeah, I'll turn it down in a minute. Uh, but I, I can't I can't wait to talk with you about the agriculture system assignment and our allocations. I'll get to that in just a minute. But I, I just want to convince you now that there's a few things that are more important than agriculture. It is the, one of the biggest impacts we humans have on the biosphere. Okay, I'll turn it down. Let's review the assignment. The task before you was to solve the world's sustainable development challenges associated with agriculture. You were given control over all the resources for the next couple years and asked to divide them up amongst these challenges. And so you see my allocations, if I were the czar, uh, and I'm going to give you my explanations here in a few minutes. But first, I want to go over what I think are some of the main issues. I'm going to do that by walking us through some system maps. They're pretty complicated, but absolutely fascinating. So you might want to pause and look at them a little bit longer than I have to talk about them. But first, I want to convince you that agriculture is something we all do. We're all directly connected. We, we put stuff in our mouths three or four times a day. We eat, we're responsible, we can affect a lot of change. This graphic by the World Resource Institute, I think paints the overall challenge we have. Uh, we're basically hammering the biosphere, and I'll explain that in a little bit more. And we've got to increase it, uh, food consumption, calories produced by 60, maybe 100 percent. There are almost a third of us, 28 percent or so, are involved in agriculture, so we're going to be affecting a lot of people. It's really only 10 percent or so of the total economy, so the people aren't paid that well, but there's a lot of people involved. And the greenhouse gas emissions are, are enormous, like maybe a third or so, uh, depending on how the accounting goes. Here's another image we've seen before. This is the planetary boundaries. This one is a little different in that it focuses just on the role of agriculture. And you can see here, we're blowing past a couple of the boundaries that create the safe operating space for human civilization. Biodiversity loss, certainly. That's because we've cleared so much habitat to produce our, our farm and agriculture production. Uh, nitrogen cycle, that's all the, f the fixing of nitrogen for fertilizer. Climate change, just because we've cleared so much forest as well as all the methane and other gases coming out of the soil and, and animals. So we're having a huge impact on the biosphere by agriculture and we're going to have to maybe double productivity. That's the challenge. Here's another system map. This one shows where the money goes of every dollar spent on food. And you can see a small fraction of it, 10%, 11.6% goes to farm and agribusiness. And actually maybe just a few cents on the dollar goes to the farmer. Food processing is another almost 20%. And then the services, the, the production and, and shipping and packaging and providing of it. That's, that's the bulk of it. So the point here is that it's very difficult to incentivize farmers with, uh, with, with economic incentives because there, there's very little money that goes from the consumer to the producer. Here's another way to look at the food system, and this is sort of who owns it. Now, there are literally millions of producers, but uh, only a handful of them have lots of power. Most of it's widely distributed, but those that handful controls most of the food supply. So you can see Cargill and Tyson's and others control a lot of the food system. Here's another way of looking at the power slash ownership structure. This is the seed sources, and you can see just a few companies own most of the seed source. Bayer and Monsanto up there in the left-hand corner have since merged, but this is a tremendous amount of control over primary production seed sources. An important implication is that just a few companies have a lot of control. And if we target them, if they change their behavior, then the whole market flips. And so there's a lot of attention and energy on these companies and efforts to work with them to become more sustainable. Uh, here's the foreshadow, a debate we're going to have in a little bit. Another way of thinking about the food system is who prepares our food or where we get it. Uh, and this graph shows that the food system has been changing dramatically over a couple decades, is that most of us now get our food away from home. Uh, of course, that's prior to uh, the pandemic. <clears throat> a lot of uh, people eat at restaurants or get their food prepared by somebody else who comes in a pizza box or a can, and we might bring it home. But the point here is that a lot of our food is prepared, designed, the ingredients are decided by somebody else, by a food service professional, somebody that we can influence to change diets and ingredients.
This is significant because we know that individual consumers are not very receptive to information and knowledge and um, facts about how, to, how they ought to eat. Uh, but food service professionals, educated people with a lot of ego invested in doing the right thing, they are receptive to that kind of information. It's hard to overemphasize uh, the importance of diet and dietary choices, uh, as illustrated here by how inefficient it is to eat meat. It just takes so much more land, produces so much more carbon, requires so much more water, destroys so much more biodiversity because we're feeding the crops that we grow on the land. We're feeding them then to animals who, in essence, waste a lot of that energy in terms of producing heat, in terms of moving around, in terms of belching out uh, methane, and, and where we could have eaten it uh, directly. We use about half of our agricultural land is used and devoted to producing meat. Let's just look at corn. This is a stanky diagram of the flow of corn, where it goes in the United States. You can see most of it, it comes from production, comes from the farm. Some of it comes from inventory. A little bit of that is exported or put back into seed source and, and inventory. But most of it goes over there in the, in the right-hand corner, goes to animal feed, goes to, to cattle, poultry, and, and, and pigs, right? Um, another big hunk of it goes to our gas tanks. So if people are going hungry, uh, part of the reason is because we're, we're putting that uh, food in our gas tanks. Just down there in the lower right, that's that's all it is that we're actually eating directly, right? And some of it is alcohol, moonshine, other of it is corn sugar and what have you. Uh, but very little bit of it is the cereal or actual food itself, corn on the cob, right? So most of it is used for other purposes. Here's another fascinating system diagram, uh, and it's pretty complicated, so you might want to pause and stare at it. But let me give you the highlights here before you do. The, the blue it, bars represent how much greenhouse gases per kilogram of product. The green is how much greenhouse gases per 100 calories of product. And the red, which I think is the most significant point here, is the greenhouse gases per protein. And I think that's significant because most people argue that they need protein from meat. You can see here how, how lamb and beef and dairy generally are all pretty, pretty horrible. Uh, so if you want to minimize your greenhouse gases for protein and you have to have, have kind of animal protein, Protein, then chicken or eggs, and certainly beans and lentils are best. Here's a cool example that should really give you some heartburn if you're worried about greenhouse gas emissions and like surf and turf. Uh, shrimp are, are really destructive of mangroves, so there's a lot of biodiversity and greenhouse gas emissions that are released. And of course, beef is also very destructive, and, and if you think of all the forests that has to be cut down, they're huge, hugely impactful. So if you have a surf and turf, just one meal of surf and turf, it releases the equivalent greenhouse gases to driving a fuel fishing car from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles. Wow. We also need to think about our dietary choices impacts on water. And here we can see there's a wide range of varying impacts. Up in the far right, beef and then lamb would be worse than it, uses huge amounts of water per serving. But even beans and nuts down there in the bottom right, they're not great. So if you're in a water stressed area, uh, these crops may not be the best choice. Um, eggs uh, over on the left and poultry uh, are actually are better. So again, dietary choices matter significantly. Continuing the theme of agricultural's impact on water, let's look at runoff from fertilizer. This green stuff is algae that bloom as a, because of excess fertilizer runoff. You remember from the system assignment, the previous system assignment on water, how much of the fertilizer that gets applied actually runs off. That is, it's not absorbed by the plants. It's excess. And that produces dead zones, algae blooms, that some become quite toxic to all life forms. You also recall that agriculture uses about 70% of the freshwater supplies. A lot of that is pumped out of aquifers, and it's not being replaced. And as a result, there are around the world, here in California, there's land subsidence. That's 1977 when this photograph was taken by Dr. Poland, and up at the top is 1925. That's how much the land has subsided. And this is occurring around the world, sometimes dozens of meters a year. And here is one last image to drive home this relationship between ag and water. And here you can see the projected water shortages 
just in the U.S. And note that they're basically under the, the breadbaskets of the U.S. In Florida, where a lot of vegetables are grown, in the Midwest, and in California. So because of uh, climate change and overpumping and aquifer depletion, we're potentially in for a world of hurt. So we're going to have to increase the food supply, but we're already hammering the biosphere. What are some solutions? Well, managing waste is one of them. Here's a graph I think you're familiar with. It's a World Resource Institute. I'll pause on this a bit because it's pretty complicated. I want to make sure you understand it. It maps where the, the waste is coming from. But what's what's pretty consistent is about 25 to 30 percent of of, of, of the food that we use is wasted, that, so we can save it, and that, that reduces the, the need to increase production. And it varies very much by country. Uh, you can see in the developed world, uh, over there on the left is North America, most of the waste is, is consumption. It's, it's that we just don't eat it. We throw it away. It rots in our refrigerator. Whereas over on the right side, in the developing world, a lot of the waste is caused by poor infrastructure. There's lack of refrigeration or lack of transport. The crops rot in the field or they rot on their way to market or they're not packaged and stored in a way or with preservatives that uh, help them be, maintain freshness. Um, so we can we can manage waste uh, dramatically, uh, but it's going to differ by region how we do it. Well, what else can we do? We can create alternative kinds of food. We can grow meat in test tubes. Um, I'm not a big fan of this because of the enormous amounts of energy and water it takes to do that. Uh, there are impossible burgers beyond beef. I think that's a much more viable solution. That's basically a vegetable substitute for, for meat, not, not growing it in, in the lab. Or we could eat insects. Insects grow really quickly, very efficiently. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to get protein. Although uh, some of you probably had it, most of you are probably not yet keen on shifting to this as your protein source. Okay, it's now time for me to explain my evaluations. And I've already revealed uh, my hand quite a bit uh, in uh, my explanation of the system maps earlier. But I want to begin uh, with talking about the two that I have labeled in blue. They're different than the other, uh, other entries, right? Uh, have you figured that out? Can, can, you, can you think why they're different? It's because they're both about demand. They're both about changing the consumer. They're about changing our behavior. Uh, the other, everything else is about changing supply. It's some sort of technical technological innovation that's going to solve the problem with, with a change in supply. Whereas the heavier lifts and some of the more consequential ones with dealing with uh, generating waste and changing our diet. Let's start with eliminating waste. Uh, there's so many things we can do. One cool thing that Virginia Tech did, pretty easy, is you eliminate trays. You know, if you had a tray, you're a buffet, it's at all you can eat, you fill that thing up and you only eat a little bit of it and you throw the rest away. But if you don't have trays, you have to go back for more and you only get what you can eat. And by eliminating trays, Virginia Tech eliminated dumpsters of food waste. Something we sometimes don't think about, in part because sustainability professionals tend to be opposed to plastic and preservatives, but they save a lot of food and keep it from rotting. Another thing we can do is we can educate consumers about what a use-by date means. When, what, what actually does it mean when, a food, when the use-by date is passed? So often it's not that the food is bad, it's just that it no longer tastes at its prime. So there are lots of things we can do to reduce waste. In the developed world, it's going to take a little bit of investment in wrapping, packaging, preservatives, as well as education. Uh, but in the, in the developing world, it's going to take some serious investment of infrastructure, refrigeration, sorting sheds, better ways to keep the food from rotting in the field. Another thing we can do is change diets. Uh, it, just about anything that moves beef and lamb off the center of the plate is a big deal. Uh, people don't like to change their diets, so it's going to be a, a long, hard push here, but it's slowly happening. Uh, there's some very f great initiatives. I mean, it's Meatless Monday and other kinds of things work, but even just ch selecting the type of meat that you eat, so emphasizing maybe poultry over beef, it make a huge difference, right? Or not eating, not eating shrimp. Um, so what are the what are the choices we have? Are things like 
plant forward menus and, and ingredients. There's a, some terrific work being done by an organization called Menus of Change, another one, Changing Taste. You should Google them. And what they're doing is recruiting high profile chefs to help create uh, buzz and menus and recipes and ingredient lists that basically move the meat off the center and, and off to the side, more like a condiment, and, and, and making uh, dishes of emphasize uh, protein and flavor and serving sizes that are much more sustainable. So there's a lot we can do to affect diet, and, and it's going to take uh, some change to make that happen. Uh, and as a result, I've put some money in it, even though it is behavior change. One of the things I suggest we not do is cultivate more lion. We could cut down the few forests that are remaining and, and plow it over and, and release all the carbon out of the soil and the, and the forest and the, and the atmosphere and kill the biodiversity and pump out the, the, the water. But I, it's just unacceptable consequences to me. So cultivating land is off the table. Certainly one of the things I did put a lot of money into, in fact, the most money is intensification. That is to figure out how to make the best practices that are on some parts of the land now spread over over the globe. Because if we have uh, the best practices, that is the the land producing the most uh, beef or corn or cotton or rice, whatever it is we're producing per hectare, um, we can actually meet our food needs now. That is, if we can spread the best management practices, and that probably means really smart agriculture. It means. Uh, monitoring and and digi digital techniques that uh, manage irrigation, uh, manage fertilizer, manage weeding and plowing and all kinds of other things. So there's a lot of technology we can use to increase increase the agricultural productivity. It also means a lot of genetically modified organisms. Everything from changing soybeans so that they can be planted without tilling, which saves a lot of soil loss and carbon loss, uh, to increasing the capacity of the, of the plant to absorb carbon dioxide, to, to input some of the so-called C4 uh, processes into C3 plants. Uh, the other thing we need to do is regenerative, restorative agriculture that uh, improves the, the fertilization, improves the, the, the salinity, uh, improves the degraded soil. There's a lot of land out there that now is abandoned because it's been poorly used or polluted, and we need to figure out how to bring that back into production. And so there's money to be spent here, and there's huge gains in terms of uh, food productivity as well as saved biodiversity and other ecosystem services. As you can see, I also put a fair bit of money into climate vulnerability. I'm increasingly worried about this. As you know, hotter temperatures will decrease plant productivity. The increasing water scarcity from climate change is going to disrupt crops. The soil carbon loss and microbe uh, loss uh, is going to decrease fertility. There's going to be new pests migrating in that are going to destroy crops. Uh, more variable frosts and droughts, uh, perhaps a need to relocate farms further north, at least in the northern hemisphere. Uh, both the um, climate vulnerability and uh, intensification are very high tech. Uh, options. So um, I'm, I'm pushing a lot of technology here. I think uh, we're going to need that in order to feed the world and adapt to climate change. See, I did put a little money into biomaterials and bioenergy. Well, actually not bioenergy. I don't think it's a good idea to put corn into, into ethanol or switchgrass uh, or forest into, into biofuels. Uh, it's just the cost is too high in terms of water and biodiversity. Uh, but biomaterials, over the last couple of years, I've, I've, I've begun to think that, that we need we need to put more money into that, to, to replace plastics, uh, uh, to replace, or at least petroleum-based plastics, to replace uh, steel, to, uh, to replace maybe cement, or basically these are very high carbon intensive intensive products, plastic, steel, cement, and uh, bio-based materials it would be a good, good substitute for that. And so we need, to, we need to put money and research to figure out how to do this. And that's also a big part of the circular economy is to, is to replace the non-renewable inputs into, into the economy now with the renewable biomaterials. Let's see, what have I not put any money in here? Uh, well, let's take the non-controversial one, the new food. Um, I am I'm all in favor of new food. I think there'll be new foods and you know, Impossible Burgers and Beyond Beef are great examples. Um, I think there's money to be made there. And, and I think Silicon Valley is all over it. So I think the investors will do it. There's not really justification to put in public dollars into, into new foods.
Okay, let me get into the controversial ones. Uh, please don't hate me for it, but I'm coming out against organic and local foods. Uh, there's a lot of mythology and misunderstanding and zealotry. Uh, people believe it's just good because it's good. Uh, uh, bear with me, uh, I'm gonna explain myself uh, and give you a little confession. Um, uh, there's some good literature, it's in the, in the references, and so uh, dig into that. Um, the problem, biggest problem with organic and local is that it's not as efficient as intensified agriculture. And as a result, we have to cultivate more land. That means we have to cut down more biodiversity. That means, I mean, cut down more forests. That means destroy more biodiversity and release more carbon uh, and, and use more water. Uh, and that cost is just unacceptable to me. Um, there you know, a lot of discussion about organic being healthier. There's not really a lot of support in the literature for that. It may taste better. I, I, I'm not going to refute that. I don't think that's a relevant issue. I mean, aesthetics are fine, but that's not a reason for a policy decision here. Um, the relationship between organic food and human health uh, is very tenuous and, and probably doesn't exist. Um, so let's get into localism. Okay, uh, a lot of people are localist. Uh, they believe local is good because it's local, uh, but that's a tautology. It's like saying nature is good because it's natural. Uh, we need to go beyond that tautology and actually look at the specific impact. So let's look at environmental, economic, and equity impacts of local food. Okay. Here is my confession. I spent about 15 years of my research career researching localism. I was a believer, uh, field to fork, wood to goods, all these local natural resource-based economies. Uh, unfortunately, the research didn't bear out the positive impacts. It turns out it's not so much that whether it's local or not that matters, but it matters. what matters is how it's done and who does it. Um, you know, there's lots of example, local examples, that where there's lots of pesticide application, way too much irrigation and soil erosion, uh, it, with biodiversity loss, where, the, where the, the farmer is not protecting the environment, right? And the, the food miles thing, the idea of, of local somehow having a smaller carbon footprint, that, that's, that's a faulty logic. It turns out that the, uh, the, the carbon footprint is associated with transportation is actually very small, but most of the carbon footprint is associated with growing the crop. So what really matters is being located where the sun is best, the water's best, the pests are best, the, the nutritional value of the soil is best, whatever it takes to grow that crop most efficiently, that will reduce the carbon footprint. The carbon footprint associated with transportation could actually be worse for localism because the, the, the truck going back and forth from the farm to the farmer's market is pretty inefficient. People have to drive to the farmer's market and they only buy a few things there, then they have to go shopping elsewhere. So there actually might be more carbon emissions in a very efficient transport system. So from an environmental perspective, it's not food miles. There may be more pesticide application. There may be more land use, there may be erosion, there may be water use. It's possible that local is bad on many fronts for regarding the environment. Okay, Bruce, you ask, so what about the second E, economics, right? That's gotta be better for localism. Well, again, um, probably not. I mean, there, there will be more dollars circulated in the local economy. But you remember the, the figure we looked at earlier, only a small percentage of the money we spend on food actually goes to the, to the farmer. And in a local economy, there'd be a little bit higher percentage because the food would actually be a little bit more expensive. But in essence, we're taking money away from other people. That, that money is gonna be spent somewhere. Most of it's gonna be spent and on packaging or production or marketing or services. And, and those people, uh, if you have a local uh, um, agriculture, those people actually be worse off, won't they? So you're actually taking money from them, right? So there's, it, it's not at all clear that from an economic perspective, it's, it's positive. Let's look at it from the perspective of comparative advantage. In a local region, all the neighbors have like lots of zucchini at the same time, or lots of strawberries, or lots of apples, or whatever it is. Whatever a local area produces, they all come in at the same time. And as a result of having such an abundance of supply, there's a very diminished price. I mean, you can't give zucchinis away sometime, right? And so the, 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 if, if you could take that zucchini and, and transport it, a, a thousand miles to a place that can't grow zucchinis, then you can make some money, right? And both communities are better off. The community that doesn't have the zucchini now has it, and the community that grew it 
now has money that they can use for something else. Okay, yeah. Bruce, what about the third E, the equity or community, the third dimension of sustainable development? Are there advantages there? Well, again, it's hit or miss. Certainly there are advantages of knowing your farmer, knowing where your food comes from, but not always, right? You have to admit that there's a fair bit of oppression, racism, sexism, poor wages, poor labor practices, little economic opportunity in rural, small, local businesses, right? Whereas larger multinational co uh, companies are brand conscious, They've got human resource programs that respect equity and diversity and labor practices. They've got professional development opportunities, travel opportunities, education programs. There's all kinds of things that would make the work environment more productive, more effective. And big companies have large endowments and foundations that give money back to the community. So there's other, you know, it can be better, but it can be worse. So again, it's with same with environment, same with with, with the economy and the same with equity. It's not so much whether it's local or not that matters. What matters are, are the practices. What matters is how well the people are doing it. And that can be done globally or locally. So locally by itself is not necessarily better. It may taste better, but that's an aesthetic and I'm not willing to, to make a decision based upon that, right? And, and because it's unfortunately less productive in terms of producing the food that we need, and we have to maybe double the amount of food, uh, I think local is not a solution to the challenges we face. So that's why I didn't put any dollars in it. Sorry. Oh, darn, I let Brother Wes's music fade out here. I have to turn it back on for you. Um, I hope uh, we're still friends after this. Uh, it's a difficult subject, certainly, and I, uh, I just I want to impress upon you how important agriculture is. I mean, there are a few things that have bigger impacts on the environment than, than agriculture. And we've got to somehow double the amount of food maybe produced in order to feed a more populous and prosperous uh, uh, world population. Uh, it's, it's an amazing challenge. And I'm glad uh, that you're up to the task. Uh, so um, enjoy the rest of the program. I'm going to get back to you. Thank you.